We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our workshop at the 16th Internet Governance Forum uh, in Poland and around the world. Uh, my name is Jutta Kroll. I'm leading the project Children's Rights and Child Protection in the Digital World. And that is what you see from my background and what we, we would like to focus on. Uh, the IGF uh, 2021 started today. And when <clears throat> we look back 16 years ago in 2006, regulation, especially government regulation, was not too much in the focus of internet governance. The strategy focused on enabling a free market for digital services. And the assumption was that such a flourishing market would regulate itself. Nearly no one expected then a situation like that we have to face now. A huge amount of illegal content, in addition content, although not illegal, but still harmful to children and also to the community of internet users as large, at large. Opportunities to communicate and to interact with other users, with people around the world, but also bearing the risk of unwanted grooming and solicitation into riskful behavior, be it cyber grooming, sexual molestation or recruitment for terrorist and criminal activities. Um, we have heard it in the video at the start of this session, we all live in a digital world and children, young people under the age of 18 do so even more. So after more than a decade of deregulation and self-regulation, now government regulation features more prominently also on the agenda of this year's Internet Governance Forum. I, I would like to take this opportunity to refer you also to the main session on regulation that features on Thursday at 11.15 uh, uh, Central European time in the plenary room. In this session, we, are, we will discuss national and European approaches including the Digital Services Act to regulating the protection of children on the internet. Um, I would like to start the session with a quick round of introduction of our honorable speakers we have today here assembled in our Zoom room. And I would like to start with Bieben Kidron. Bieben is, uh, comes from uh, UK and she is uh, leading the Five Rights Foundation, who has been also working on the general comment number 25 on children's rights in the digital environment, together in close cooperation with the Child Rights Committee of the United Nations. She is an English film director, so she has a long standing experience in, in the, uh, the media and in production of media content. Uh, but I've learned her to know as a children's rights campaigner, and she's also a member of the UK House of Lords. From Egypt, we welcome engineer Hoda Daruk. Um, she has been studying at the Sorbonne in uh, Paris and has a Bachelor in Electronics and Communication from the Cairo University. Um, she has assumed several leadership positions, most recently as a member of the Presidential Advisory Council for Community Development, in addition to her position as head of the Central Department of Community Development in the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology in Egypt. Welcome, Hoda, to this session, and I'm really interested in what you have to tell us from your country. Then we have uh, Kenneth. Adu Amanfo from representing the African continent, uh, the, the voice of in, uh, civil society from the African continent. 
His organization is the Africa Cybersecurity and Digital Rights Organization, shortly ACDRO, from Ghana. Welcome, Kenneth, to our panel. From Germany, we have two colleagues from uh, the... Sorry, I, I'm missing my watch because I know you so well in German language. It's Thomas Salzmann and Michael Terhorst from the Federal Agency for Child and Youth Protection in the Media. Um, very recently established organization uh, within uh, regulated in the uh, Youth Protection Act that came into force in Germany on May 1st this year. And they will probably tell us as well from that organization and from the work they are heading to. Then we have from the government, uh, from the industry sector, David Myers, uh, my uh, good friend representing now uh, Meta. He's currently Meta's head of safety for Europe, Middle East and Africa. So covering also various regions. And he has more than 20 years of executive management experience within the technology regulatory and charitable sectors, including IBM, Compaq, the Family Online Safety Institute, and the British Board of Film Classification. I'm pretty sure Bieben and Dave, you will know each other well. Um, we had expected to have a speaker from the Polish government, but Unfortunately, Thomas Kulasa had to withdraw on very short notice because he has an appointment with the Polish prime minister and therefore he cannot represent the Ministry of Education Science uh, here in the session, but they will forward us the Polish position for our report of the session. Uh, last but not least, I'm very glad to welcome Agne Kaleb from the European Commission, DG Connect. She's a policy officer and works in the European Commission on developing effective policies on countering harms in the digital space and developing policies for a safe online space for all, which is the issue of today's session. She's also part of an international team where she's negotiating the Digital Services Act with the Council of Europe Union, European Union and the European Parliament. And we know that uh, the trilogue is, is going to start uh, very soon and that there is very much in the Di uh, Digital Services Act for the protection of children. So welcome to you, Agne, as well. Um, we have now in, in the following order uh, the on our sh agenda short introductory notes on the status quo of child online safety regulation on national and regional level. level. Uh, and after we have heard from Egypt, from Ghana, from UK and Germany, and for the European perspective, Arne Karleb, then we will go to the industry perspective from David Myers. And so I'd like to, to invite uh, um, Hoda Daruk to make a start in this session. Please go ahead, Hoda. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody in this world. Uh, I'm very happy to be in IGF 2021, as I have been there for twice before, and this is my third uh, presence uh, in this great event. And I have to express my great appreciation to Yuta for organizing such an important session and for the organizers for availing this iconic experience for all of us. In this century, the internet controls all life spheres. It serves humanity, spreads ideas, enhances freedom and opportunity across the world. In this realm, the Egyptian Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, MCIT, adopted Digital Egypt strategy and revolves around availing digital infrastructure, legislative framework, and for sure, building next generation digital skills. We have around 100 million citizens in Egypt. This is a big number, but in that realm, most of them have mobiles and internet connection. And as we believe that no one shall digitally left behind, so the internet is a basic right, 
In response, we work in implementing a promising mega project entitled Here in Egypt, Haya Karima. It is a presidential project and initiative. All the government share in it. And it is in Arabic word that means guarantee decent life to 4,200 poorest villages in Egypt and MCIT by, by uh, default, sharing by connecting them with fiber optics cables, provide all Egyptians, especially young generations, with internet, hence applying the inclusion and equity principles and preparing them for the future. However, the internet creates opportunities alongside with challenges and risks, definitely. It gives rise to cyber attacks and internet crimes like cyber bullying, especially by social media platforms. These impacts become more profound when experienced by younger generations. Egypt is obliged to most of the international and regional child protection treaties, protocols, agreements, charters, and where the government formed several specialized national committees to follow up the exclusion of these agreements. And we, as the Egyptian MCIT through the Central Department for Digital Community Development that I am honored to head it, have early tackled the internet challenges in an effective and responsible way to ensure that internet is a safer place for all citizens with a special focus on children and teens, as well as for digital business. And this is adapted through three main pillars, supporting regulators, regulations and policies, setting out the responsibilities of all industry players towards the users, and finally encourage producing age-appropriate content and services. I will stop here and we'll describe them soon to give now the floor to the panel colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hoda Daruk, uh, for your uh, first intervention. I would like to mention that uh, all participants in the room are invited to pose a first round of questions after we have had these interventions from the panelists, and then we go on to discuss uh, the policy questions. I'm, I'm here with my um, colleague Thorsten Krause from the German Char Children's Charity, Deutsches Kinderhilfswerk, who has helped to set up the session uh, and, and the agenda and who will also support with uh, the questions you pose in the chat. Um, and having said that, I would like to go forward to Kenneth from Ghana and speaking for the African continent as well. You have the floor. Kenneth, you're muted. You're muted. You need to. Thought that was on. Now we can hear you fine. Can, can you hear me now? Oh. Yes, okay. we can hear you very well. Okay. So, um, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Just okay. go ahead, please. All Tell right. us thank, thank, the status quo. Cool. Exactly, exactly. So thank you so much. And um, I'm glad to be part of speaking at this very important IGF, Global IGF Forum. Um, I've always been speaking and I'm glad to be here again. Um, just to, let me just begin by quoting from um, an article that I, I read from an article by the UNICEF on action to end child sexual abuse and and um, exploitation. In fact, it made a very profound statement that more and more children are connecting for the first time every day, either on personal or shared devices. However, wider and more easily available access to the internet and digital technology also poses significant challenges to meaningful uh, connectivity and children's rights, including safety. And uh, I found this as very, 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 very relevant. Now, it's important to know that the impact of this whole uh, threats range from the protection of the child's personal data, his privacy, harassment, um, cyber bullying, um, cyber stalking, 
harmful online content, grooming from sexual purposes and sexual abuse and exploitation. The global challenge on children, child online protection, including that which is Africa, requires a global response, an international cooperation, national coordination, and even within the country Pacific, within the region and within country, they have to be that um, effective coordination among all the various stakeholders, the relevant stakeholders. And I believe that with more relevant and digital technologies, this issue uh, of, of child uh, protection in line with the U UNCRC would be, will be uh, ahead. There are challenges and trends that persist due to the borderless nature of the online environment that we all find ourselves, the borderless environment. And um, I believe that the internet is on unregulated. And as we, we go, uh, people are trying to regulate, but it's unregulated now. And that poses more risks to our children. In fact, the children who don't even know their rights. And when it comes to even educating the, the, the users of the internet on their rights, it's more, much more difficult educating the children um, uh, on to, to know their rights online. And when we come to children within even the African region, it's more difficult because in terms of um, the tools and the equipment and the knowledge base is very low. So even to teaching them to, you know, on the rights on the, the UN Convention or that becomes a little bit, a little bit more difficult. In Ghana and also in a lot, a couple of African countries. Ghana was one of the first countries in Africa, though. That Ghana has developed a strategic, a child online policy and strategy. In fact, Ghana had partnership with the UNICEF, and and and, and they have embarked, developed this policy, and we have already started enrolling in its implementation. So awareness creation is being done, you know, using different methodologies, you know, to reach out to the to the children in the in the in the underserved and remote areas to make sure that you know that the inclusion there is that inclusion on all that space and i've seen a number of countries nigeria and other countries that are also implementing kenya is one of them that have already have their child online protection policies and strategy in place that are being implemented i believe that once we have this collaborative effort we're bringing all the stakeholders, both national and international, together to work towards a common objective to secure our borderless online environment to protect our children. I'm sure we will have we will sail through. Thank you. So I'll, I'll come up. I'll reserve the rest when as we get to to the nitty gritties of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth, for giving us an insight into not only what's going on in Ghana but also in in other countries on the African continent. I think we will get back to that question whether we need, uh, how we can achieve a global response when on the other side, like you said before, we have a borderless internet and we need a global response. Um, I would now like to turn to Biben. Biben, you have the floor to speak on the situation in your country. Uh, thank you so much, and, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I, I, I'd like to talk about uh, one, uh, two particular things in the UK, and then maybe something on the international front. Uh, the first is that the, in my uh, capacity, I'm a crossbench, that means unaligned peer in the House of Lords. Uh, I was able to introduce something called the Age Appropriate Design Code into our data bill. And I think that I would like first to just say, how important it is that when we think about child safety, that we also think about data. Because in a sense, you know, the, the design of services is really driven by a, a hunger for data, a hunger to extend our use and a hunger for network and, and growth. And that, that desire actually means that we have quite a lot of uh, features that push the behavior of children and impact on the behavior of children in particular ways. Um, and with the introduction of the age appropriate design code, we've seen some really interesting 
um, um, changes to platforms. I can't go through them all, all here. Maybe David will talk about some of the ones in Instagram uh, and, and so on. But, but what we saw was things like safe search and autoplay being turned off at YouTube and, and just stopping notifications after nine o'clock on TikTok and stopping direct messages and so on. So the first thing I'd like to say is that we have some experience here and those changes were all global. And I want to say that the, the, the code sits very much on, on, on the European leadership with GDPR and so on. But I really want to make a, a case here that child safety and children's rights are very well served by data protection and and we must consider it internationally uh, as an absolute tool. Uh, the second thing is that I actually have the privilege of, of being on what we call here the pre-legislative committee on the online safety bill. Uh, what that means is that the government has put forward a draft online safety bill with the intention of, of making the UK the safest place to be online. That's, their, that's the government's claim. Um, and, uh, and a number uh, across both houses and across all parties, uh, we were asked to look at the bill and make some recommendations. And that report will be out next week. So I can't do any spoiler alerts, but I think that what we, what we are looking at and what the evidence uh, really drove us to is, is really to look at not only how do you diminish the impact of bad actors, but how do you make uh, the online service is responsible for amplification, recommendation, spread of those bad actors. So rather than seeing it as a 2D world in which there's a bad actor and a victim, there's actually the, the, the mechanism of, of the service itself. And is it serving, you know, is it serving the safety of children? So I think that next week we will be, uh, have a lot of things coming out of that. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope that it will be both inspiration and, and, uh, and to a degree leadership in one particular area. But I think the last thing I want to say in this very short intervention is that I think we have to be careful not to keep on reinventing the wheel in every nation state and in every, in, in every place and imagine uh, that no one has done any work before. And I think that, you know, I feel very passionately that the code sitting on top of GDPR, you know, was a very successful thing. And that actually some of the, some of the looking over the, at what the, the lawmakers are doing in Europe with the DSA has been very instructive for the online safety bill. And that, that it is really important that, that we try and find responses that are both possible um, for us to share within our, you know, within the broadest sense, but also that actually drive the baseline of the tech sector up. Because I think as, as, as uh, was sort of put, uh, as, as you just said in her introduction, that really, you know, I think that the era of self-regulation, co-regulation has been something of a tragic failure. I, I regret that but it has been a tragic failure. And so if this is the era of regulation, then we have to work very smart, you know, to, to make sure that, that the fight back does not bring in its wake a whole load of unintended consequences, or indeed take out the benefits for children in particular, or that the digital world allows. So let me, let me stop there, and, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of that. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you, Beben. Thank you so much. I think uh, what you said was the perfect segue to to um, uh, um, now Germany speaking on the Youth Protection Act that has been amended uh, uh, and came into force on May 21st. You said uh, the pre-legislative committee wanted to make the UK the safest place. I do think that the legislators in Germany wanted the same for Germany. And now let's hear from uh, Thomas um, and Michael, please. You have the floor. Absolutely, Jutta. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon to everybody from um, Michael and me. Um, the usage habits of children and young persons regarding digital services have completely changed from browsing to social media, from confrontation to interaction. 
This leads to new opportunities, but also to new challenges and risks we've heard about yet. Based on a reform of the German Youth Protection Act this year, the Federal Agency for Child and Youth Protection in the Media now pursues various approaches to establish a modernized protection of minors in the media. To a holistic concept of youth protection, we have to go from protection by shielding to a triad of protection, empowerment, and participation. This approach follows the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the general comment on the rights of children in the digital environment. First of all, shielding minors from harmful content is still an important factor in our youth protection concept. The federal agency indexes harmful content, content that makes it illegal to provide it to minors. But what is more, we have a strong legal mandate to inform and give orientation about harmful phenomena. So media literacy became a part of the regular concept of youth protection. But finally, how do you strengthen the children's rights, the children's rights of participation in digital media, although social media and games involve a great variety of risks. Risks from communication and contact functions, purchase functions, mechanisms to promote excessive media use behavior, and so on. The new law wants the companies to build a structure of protection and support in the digital services that are favored by young persons. These precautionary measures include, for example, child-friendly terms and conditions, safe default settings for the use of services that limit the risk of use depending on age, and child-friendly notice and takedown or support opportunities. Probably later, we can give you a short overview about the different approaches to implement precautionary measures in digital services. These are a joint exercise of responsibility by state authorities, companies, and the civil society, and a dialogic regulation which might end in a law enforcement process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for your insight in, into the amended German law. And I think we will discuss this approach of dialogic regulation further. I think it builds also somehow a basis of the Digital Services Act that Agne Kaleb is now talking about uh, on behalf of the European Commission DG Connect. Agne, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Jutta, and, uh, and good evening, everyone, or good morning to others, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, so the EU is in the process of overhauling uh, the horizontal legislation, the e-commerce directive, which has uh, been sort of the cornerstone of governance of the Internet since uh, in, from the year 2000. And uh, I think we can all safely say that in the past two decades, uh, the digital space has fundamentally changed um, and, uh, and changed also us, the way we live, we work, we communicate. Um, and so in response to uh, to, to sort of looking at, uh, at these challenges in the online space um, and also uh, sort of looking at uh, regulatory developments in member states as, uh, as, uh, as Germany has just uh, mentioned and, uh, and also previously also in the UK. Um, the Commission uh, proposed a Digital Services Act with the aim to ensure safety of users online, including children and minors. Um, while also providing, of course, strong safeguards to protect fundamental rights. And so with this horizontal piece of legislation, we're responding to some of the key challenges that we have seen uh, in the online space. So the spread of illegal content, uh, insufficient protection of, uh, of user rights or fundamental rights online, and also systemic risks stemming from the way the digital space functions itself. So including the way algorithms and content moderation systems uh, work. Uh, 
Um, so we've set out a number of obligations, and I think I will get to these a little bit later in the session, uh, a, a bit in more detail. But to say up front that measures to ensure the safety of children and minors are, are certainly have an important place there. And, uh, and of course, this is just a proposal. So we are still negotiating together with all the member states and uh, the European Parliament. Um, but we've already seen uh, that the Council, who's uh, just recently come to uh, a, a unified position, has made some amendments to further highlight the importance of tackling issues related to children and minors. So we can be somewhat assured that in the negotiations, this ambition will, will be maintained. Um, but I think just important to note that this is not, this is not the only piece of legislation uh, in the EU that, uh, that exists that targets these issues. Among others, as Bieben was saying, it's GDPR, uh, which has targeted rules uh, related to minors. Um, there's also the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, um, which has rules related to audiovisual media services, as well as video sharing services. And also looking into the near future, we're in the process of developing a new strategy for better internet for children. And we can also expect um, soon sectoral legislation to combat uh, the challenge of child sexual abuse material uh, specifically. Um, but I think I will stop here for the moment as an introduction and uh, looking forward to, to the rest of the session. Thank you, Agne, for, for giving us uh, a first impression on what we have to expect from the European Commission. Uh, and the harmonization uh, on European level. Um, now we turn to David Myers from industry and would like to hear the perspective of a platform provider in regard of being regulated or doing self-regulation and uh, taking their duty of care responsibly. David Myers, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jutta. Um, firstly, thank you for inviting me to speak on Meta's behalf as part of today's discussion. And as I was preparing for today, I was reflecting on my very first IGF in Sharm el Sheikh in 2009. A lot has changed in Egypt and beyond since then. But what was apparent then and up until a few years ago was the fact that in terms of children's digital lives, there was little or no regulation. What there was was about the collection of data with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA, and the FTC revision effective in July 2013 and GDPR. And now in 2021, here in Poland at the 16th IGF, and more than a decade on, that period of self-regulation is coming to an end. Of the 120 countries in EMEA I oversee, more than 20 have child privacy or safety regulation on the way or already on the statute books. The age appropriate design code in the UK, the German federal and interstate youth protection laws, I think are uh, excellent best practice examples of the kind of work that's going on and will influence, I think, a lot of other regulation around the world. At Meta, we've advocated for democratic governments to set new rules for the internet on areas like harmful content, privacy, data and elections, because we believe that businesses like ours should not be making these decisions on our own. While people often agree, uh, disagree about exactly where to draw the line, government regulation can establish standards for all companies and standards that we should be able to meet. Companies should also be judged on how their rules are enforced. Our community standards let our users know what they can and cannot do on Facebook or Instagram. Through our quarterly community standards enforcement report, Meta has been published figures on how it deals with harmful content, including how much of it is seen and taken down for the past three years. Our next report will be subject to external audit. And along with the oversight board, we continue to lead the way in our approach to transparency and accountability. Of our 60,000 employees here at Meta, 40,000 work in safety and security, and I'm one of those. We've spent more than $5 billion in the last year to ensure our users are kept safe and feel empowered to connect and build community. 
we can always do more. But the safety app he uses is vitally important, including cross collaboration through organizations like the Tech Coalition, a range of international organizations, and forums like the IGF. Uh, I look forward to today's discussion and back to you, Yuta. Thank you, David. I think we've now got a good overview on what is already regulated, what is in the line, what is about to come within the next month and probably years, because we don't know how much time it will take to discuss all the amendments to the Digital Services Act that are already there. And uh, I would like to encourage participants in the room, be it virtually on Zoom or be it on site in Katowice, please raise your hand, please come forward and bring your questions. You probably have directly to the panelists uh, to the attention of, of our session. I've already seen that a colleague from Mexico is in the room virtually, I think. Mauricio Hernandez, could you give us an impression how the situation is in Mexico? I, I do remember that when we had the uh, IGF in Jalisco some years ago, that that like gave a push to to the situation in your country as well. Would you be able to speak to us? Absolutely, uh, Jira. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to join the session from Mexico City this time. Well, the situation in Mexico is very it's very difficult right now, as in most parts of Latin America. We are facing um, a problem regarding um, this uh, illegal movement of uh, minors from uh, Central America up to Canada and Europe. What um, I would like to share, it's about a possibility, I think we need to talk um, between uh, promoting a legislation that will share um, technology, uh, technological uh, developments but with a human right charisma. And with this, I want to mean that uh, uh, considering uh, children, um, illegal activities and crimes, we all need to develop a shared agenda and a, and a, and a shared regulation for internet and uh, uh, platform standards. It would not be possible to fight um, against the jurisdiction rules if we do not have uh, standardized uh, rules in order to how to proceed from the private sector and the platforms in order to provide a, a, at least the minimum safe environment to our children. On the other hand, what we, I, I believe that what we need is um, the compromise and the commitment from platforms to develop and to limit this technology respecting human rights. And human rights uh, for children means taking um, the safety of their identity, considering some kind of limits for sharing contents and to develop uh, by ages, some kind of content they are allowed to, to share, to, to get into, to consume. We need to consider that uh, uh, minors' um, data is the most profitable asset we will have in the activity of the internet because they will continue um, developing as uh, regular consumers when they come into age. So if we do not consider and commit as companies and stake as stakeholders to develop and standardized rules that will be flat all worldwide. We are not going to be able to provide authorities the enough uh, abilities to uh, pursue and, um, and condemn the uh, illegal activities that, that are committed not only Latin America and Mexico for sure, and that, that's a pity I, 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 I must admit, but also in the rest of the world who are consumers of this um, children products, let's say like that. Okay, and it's it's a pleasure, Jutta, and, and all the rest of my colleagues to meet this afternoon in Poland, this wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mauricio. I'm I'm uh, really appreciate that you uh, highlighted that uh, the how did you put it? Minus data is the most profitable profitable uh, assets because they will stay, uh, of course, online for a long time, and that we have to take care of that. Uh, uh, we we have done so with the with the European GDPR, and we are looking further beyond uh, Europe as well. I, I think and this I, is I will have to add uh, something. One more minute, just from the educational side. In Latin America, at least, uh, information uh, technologies and uh, computer law is not uh, a formal. Um, area of education from the beginning. And I think mm -hmm. that we are living uh, and relying everything in law and in the authorities when the, education, when the education system and the education ministries must begin working about how to promote the responsible and accountability um, profile while uh, surfing in internet. And that's for all of us. If I remember pretty good in, in Jalisco, uh, a kid that says, what well, the matter with my data on the net? Well, I think that we have to change that, that chip in, in my uh, uh, mind. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mauricio. Uh, maybe we can turn now to the, the first policy question we uh, wanted to discuss in this session, and that is how can we ensure that government regulation, self-regulation, and co-regulation approaches to content moderation and child online safety are compliant with human rights frameworks, that they are transparent and accountable and enable a safe, united and inclusive internet, which is the whole overarching theme of this Internet Governance Forum. When you, Mauricio, mentioned a human rights charisma regulation, I think that is a fine term to describe what we are looking for but how could we ensure that and i i have uh hoda and agna on my list to try to give an answer to that question so i would like to take agna first now and then probably hoda and also other speakers and panelists are invited to answer the question how can we content moderation balance with and child online safety balance with human rights frameworks. Agne. Thanks, Jutta. This is something we tackled and then sort of analyzed a lot in the preparation of the Digital Services Act because it's absolutely a central, central element uh, of, of our approach. Um, and we paid also a lot of attention to work which has already, and there's a lot of work that has gone into thinking on how to design legislation which is compliant with human rights frameworks. So we consulted a lot also the work done on uh, in the Council of Europe, as well as the UN, for example, the UN Guiding Principle for Businesses and Human Rights. And just so maybe a couple of things to highlight, which, uh, which we baked into the DSA proposal and um, and which uh, respond to, to some of the key elements we found in these, in these frameworks. Um, so one element is proportionality. So we've designed the rules that apply to these services, which are first affected by the challenges. And the rules are designed to be proportionate to the size of the service and also compatible with the type of the service. Because, of course, the online space features so many different services. And for example, just Meta on the call itself offers you know, a gazillion different services, which all have to apply different types of rules. Um, so this is an important element. Um, then, of course, the respect to fundamental rights has been sort of overarching into um, all the different, uh, different rules. And there's maybe two principles there to highlight. So rules which could lead to removal of content are strictly limited to illegal content. And they're clear, the definitions on those are, are clear in terms of what it is uh, illegal and what is not. Um, and also there's um, extensive rules designed around redress. So users can have um, redress and measures for any content moderation decisions which affects them. 
including where the decisions are taken because the content is illegal or if the if the content is against the terms of service um, as decided by the the specific service itself so these are some of the important uh, important elements there and then what we also have done is we've looked at the the sort of systems of these um, um, of the of the services that we're regulating as opposed to regulating sort of specific types of content or setting out a very specific measure i think this is also something that germany has taken the approach in their uh, regulation um, or their legislation um, and so for example we've designed a, a risk assessment framework for very large online platforms and they're um, required to assess the specific risks their services pose to the rights of the child and take mitigating measures to counter them. So this assessment is service specific and the measures to be taken are open-ended. So it ensures that um, the measures can be tailored to the service and they can also be future-proof because of course we are only we're always evolving, we're always learning more, we're finding new research and new ways to um, sort of mitigate the harms online. Um, and this is also part of, of the future sort of proof approach. And finally, I mean, absolutely key in, in any human rights framework is accountability and transparency. Um, in the DSA, uh, we measure um, and we oversee um, this in a numerous, numerous ways. So firstly, um, service providers will have to um, set out transparency in the transparency reports of what they've done in, in their content moderation decisions. They also need to be clear about their terms and conditions, and these need to be very clear and transparent. And the council also added specifically that um, these also need to be understandable to minors uh, and clear to minors. Um, but also, of course, this is something from the perspective of the service provider. So we also need independent verification of these types of uh, actions that are being taken uh, by the industry. And there we have set out an obligation to have independent audits uh, of these types of risks and the mitigating measures, as well as data access um, to researchers who can also independently analyze whether and how these risks arise and whether these mitigating measures which are being taken are effective. Um, in, and in addition to this, of course, we have regulatory supervision. So what's important here is, is as I think the German colleagues already mentioned in their intervention, is that it's, uh, the result is a combination of efforts from um, civil society, from researchers, from the industry, as well as um, uh, from regulators. And this is all set in sort of one uh, rule book, but the implementation is, a, is very much a combination of various actors who all have an important role to play. Thank you, Agna. Um, your intervention gives me a ground to, to before we go to uh, Dr. Uh, Hoda Dahu, um, to, to refer to David as well as to back to you. You said that there is uh, this uh, risk assessment framework for the very large platforms, which are, uh, if I remember right, have a threshold of 45 million users uh, in Europe. Um, I assume that this, this will also uh, only apply for like TikTok or Instagram when I look to platforms that are used by uh, children or by young people under the age of 18. Uh, in the German law, we have a threshold for the duty of care for platforms at 1 million users. And I'm wondering how this fits together, whether the, the lower threshold even uh, will stay in, in force or whether the overall 45 million users threshold uh, will uh, apply across Europe and lower thresholds don't, uh, uh, don't, we don't stick to that. Could, could you give a short answer to that question? Um, so just to say in terms of the, the threshold is set at 45 million um, because uh, 
the active user definition will be set out in in a, in a separate act um, according to the commission proposal we don't exactly know uh, which platforms uh, will be in scope so that we can't unfortunately comment on and as to the interaction of the eu level rules versus member state rules um, this is also a case by case assessment uh, because EU rules, of course, it's a regulation, so it's directly applicable. So any rules conflicting with or regulating explicitly the exact same area uh, might need to be amended. But whether this is exactly the case with the uh, Youth Protection Act is something of a case by case assessment and, uh, and not necessarily for the entire scope, etc. So, so this will really need to be uh, looked at more carefully by, by legal experts. Thank you so much for, for your explanation. Uh, you also have been talking about the redress for users, but I think we can turn to that uh, question a bit later, uh, hearing first from Dr. Dahouk from Egypt. Hoda, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So uh, to reply to the question, I have to go in details for the three adapted uh, main mechanisms that uh, I just mentioned first supporting regulations and policies. Um, the Egyptian government is undertaking serious steps to ensure robust and transparent regulation for child online protection and content moderation, which includes, as example, Egypt was one of the first 20 countries to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child CRC. Additionally, Egypt has ratified. Uh, op uh, optional protocols to the CRC, which signifies Egypt's commitment to children's rights. Uh, for the legislative framework is one of the pillars of building digital Egypt. Hence the MCIT launched national cybersecurity strategy 2017-2021 that targets providing a safe and secure environment that would enable various sectors to deliver integrated e-services. Also in uh, July 2020, His Excellency President Abdel Fattah Sisi uh, ratified the Personal Data Protection Law uh, 151 of 2020. Law is part of MCIT efforts to protect the personal data of citizens and uh, residents of Egypt. As well, Egypt launched the National Human Rights Strategy 2021, which includes the political human rights the women and children rights, the economic rights, and the youth and people with disabilities rights. Um, and this is, was a great initiative in Egypt and a great steps towards uh, a, a lot of issues and a lot of human rights. The government has established a set of strategies and organizational bodies to guide and oversee the implementation of child safeguarding mechanism, including the National Committee for Child Online Protection, which supports a safe environment for internet usage among children. In addition to assessing the current status of child online protection in Egypt through providing studies, research, open dialogue, awareness session, and et cetera. Additionally, supports a, part a participatory approach in implementing e-citizenship an online safety strategy, which is a platform through open and multi-stakeholders dialogue in order to foster synergies, benefit from the expertise of all stakeholders, including parents, educators, and the children themselves, and consider their perspective, which ensure a consistency of impact. And I, I believe that after COVID, this digital platform was so, so important to include all stakeholders and not uh, left anyone behind to share all dialogues of how to guarantee the online safety uh, stretch. Going to the second pillar, setting out the responsibilities of all industry players toward their users, the government alone will not be able to ensure a safe and a transparent online environment. So MCIT cooperates with several stakeholders to achieve this mission and works toward mobilizing private sector stakeholders, especially 
service providers, industry representatives to take an active part in the awareness raising efforts, highlighting child safeguarding measures and disseminating key messages on safe online behavior for children, parents, and caregivers. So MCIT and the National Committee for Child Online Protection participating in raising hours of risks and in promoting technological skills. While technology and the internet present limitation for child online safety, it possesses the remedy for online threats. It offers new means for documenting and tracking these threats. So MCIT with ICMAC and Microsoft has cooperated in implementing child exploitation tracking systems, old sets, technology to protect youth and the children online. As part of MCIT strategy of stakeholders engagement in child online protection, the MCIT is establishing a multi-sectorial forum through the digital citizenship platform to enhance stakeholder coordination and to engage decision and policy makers to strengthen the capacity of the national protection system to prevent all forms of online violence against children. And the last pillar, that encouraging the production of age-appropriate online content and services. Since 2007, MCIT has focused on affording accessibility and availability of technology, especially in remote and marginalized areas. However, in fast-changing world, we realize that citizens need to master the digital world to need awareness and dynamic source of knowledge to face the emerging risks. At the same time, today's children and youth tend to avoid traditionally the uh, traditional knowledge resources and instead they get their information about the public sphere from social media. And this need more to recognize the rights, responsibilities, and opportunities of living, learning, and work. This was the catalyst of launching the Digital Citizenship Initiative to prepare our younger generations to benefit from the knowledge society and at the same time protect themselves. Digital Citizens Initiative is mobilizing multi-stakeholders collaboration to increase Kura, you need to come to an end. Uh, okay. We are running okay. out of time, I'm sorry. So, so this uh, platform increase the access uh, to specialized knowledge and valid content, enhance awareness, support the activation of policies and regulations that enhance online protection. Now we are working on this national level and with related stakeholders to build one stop shop platform. And I be here, uh, stop here to avail the others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoda. You know that uh, it's most important to be as interactive as possible at the Internet Governance Forum sessions. And so I, I really would like to encourage also participants to the session to raise their hand and, and speak up uh, and raise their questions to the panelists. Uh, what you said, uh, Hoda, leads me to the second policy question that we wanted to address in this session. And I would like to invite Bieben to speak on what needs to be done by the respective stakeholders to ensure the human rights granted to children in the UNCRC are protected, respected, and fulfilled in the digital environment. And that is exactly what the general comment number 25 is asking for. So could you yeah. explain that a little bit more to us, Stephen? No, I'm smiling because it's such an enormous question uh, in a very <laughs> short time. Um, but I, I think that, that the first thing that I'd like to say is we've got to stop pretending that, that values are neutral. Yeah, so I think that there's something that enters the conversation as if where we are now is neutral and if we seek to impose something on behalf of children or other users, that suddenly we are asserting some uh, new set of values that stops the neutrality of the environment. And I think that what we know is that the, the, there's, there's really nothing neutral in the 21st century um, experience. In fact, it's, it's highly automated, highly directed, highly targeted uh, around all sorts of different values. So I think that if we are to see the general comment manifest itself on behalf of children, we have to first make a societal decision 
that that is what we wish to do. Now, I definitely am on record saying we wish to do it. Moreover, I would say we've all, 196 countries have signed up to do it, and, and it's about how we do it. But but I do think that that argument is not 100% one in the, in the political and public arena. And so I think those of us who are very committed have to acknowledge that. That's number one. Um, I think uh, number two, uh, I, I would say, you know, we have to start embedding it in other things. I mean, I am really delighted that it, it currently sits in the EU AI Act. It's cited there. Um, I think there's a move possibly to put it into the, the DSA. There's certainly a move to put it in the online safety bill here. It's, it's a very, very important factor of the age-appropriate design code. And I, I would say for any, you know, policymakers that actually putting the, uh, we didn't have the general comment at the time, but putting the convention on the time was the only reason that we got the code for children under up to the age of 18. Yeah, because all the lobbyists came in and said, please government, no, 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 we like 13, we like 13, this is what we do in America and this is what we want to do around the world. And the government went, nothing we can do, it's on the face of the bill. So I think citing the general comment in these places allows us to make some shifts that are actually really hugely important. I would also like to really back up what was said earlier about risk assessments and, 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 the, and the way that it's being looked at in Europe. But I think those risk assessments in relation to children have to have, to have an absolute child's rights perspective. And that's a very good place to put the general comment. Um, and in relation to that, I would absolutely love to draw people's attention to uh, to the IEEE uh, age appropriate design standard, which they just published last week, which does actually cite the general comment and does take a child's rights approach to designing digital services with children in mind. And if I have a colleague on this call, maybe they can put a link in the in the chat to that. Um, the other more sort of uh, absolutely practical thing is that I currently have a bunch of uh, lawyers uh, looking right now at the general comment in the relation to UK law and saying how what they think needs to be done by whom at what point to embed it and and obviously you know we can't do that for every every territory but I think it's a, an exercise that I would love to be seen uh, see um, be mirrored elsewhere and certainly we will make available our findings to other uh, to other people to look at it from their perspective of their jurisdiction so so in a way starting the process and letting people make their own version of that process. Um, because I think that, that, that what is so important about the general comment is the indivisibility, but what is so difficult about the policy area is that you have Department of Education, you have, you have, uh, you have the DCMS here, we have the Home Office, we have Justice, you know, it goes right across. And so actually mapping who must do what when is possibly, even in one country, will pro probably give a little bit of enlightenment uh, to other places who have slightly different arrangements, but very possibly similar problems. Um, and 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 I and and again, I'm going to emphasise, you know, the participation rights of children. And and uh, one of our colleagues that worked on the general comment, Sonia Livingston, has just written a report about digital play and 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 what we need to do in order to make um, children's rights sort of a factor in designing digital play spaces online. So again, I just want to say there are so many different areas, but, but it doesn't mean we should be intimidated. We have to have a roadmap. And then I'm going to say three things in very quick succession, political will. I think that the tech industry needs to, to get our trust back. I think it has been brutally lost and it needs to be found. Um, and uh, and a sort of a radical transparency. You know, I think the sorts of transparency that people like Francis Haugen are talking about, uh, the sorts of transparency that means that we do know when things go wrong, and the sort of transparency that means instead of playing hide and seek with the big tech companies, uh, that we uh, that we um, actually are in a space that we see that actually this is having a bad impact. What what can we do to act and change? Um, and 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 I I I think that that's 
really important. And, and I just want to say one last thing, which is um, our experience here and our research here at Five Rights, it, it, do, it does rather suggest that small is not safe. And I am worried about both in the EU and here in the UK, and possibly even America, people are looking at the large platforms. Now, you know, they spend a lot of money and they spend a lot of attention, in my view, not, not, not upstream enough and not enough. Uh, but that's, but I think the, <clears throat> that we must consider that small is not safe and we must go on a risk assessment basis, not on a reach basis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beben, for putting so many things into your short statement. I'm very grateful for that. And with a question that we've received in the chat from Cosi Amesino, I would like to turn to the third question we wanted to ask, answer in this session, because I think it's very much related to each other. Um, it's a question about educating children. And uh, she's asking, he is asking for what is the parents' responsibility in child protection online? And with the third policy question, we want to answer how do we ensure a safe digital space? How should governments, internet business, and other stakeholders, and that also means parents, educators, and so on, protect children, including vulnerable citizens, against online exploitation and abuse? And um, Thomas uh, from the uh, German Federal Agency would like to speak on that, and also Agne had raised her hand in advance. Thomas, please, you're the first to speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, the answer to your question is from our point of view, together in a mandatory dialogue and permanent cooperation, and if necessary, law enforcement. The new German Youth Protection Act calls it dialogic regulation. One approach, the law gives us is uh, usually the step before obligation is a joint exercise of responsibility by the government, industry, and civil society. The idea is the development of an overall strategy for an intelligent management of chances and risks concerning the use of media by children. For bringing this, this in process, we started a project line with different event formats, the so-called Zukunftswerkstatt or Workshop of Future in English. A council of experts concerning children's rights that includes at least two persons under the age of 17 advises this process. Finally, we have the possibility to oblige relevant service providers like social media companies in a law enforcement process to implement precautionary measures for the safety of children. These measures can be tailored to the specific features of each service in a so-called dialogic regulation and by participating organizations of voluntary self-regulation which can develop guidelines under the supervision of the federal agency. Both approaches have in common that companies take a very active part in the process, just like the different media pedagogical actors, also like parents, youth protectors and children themselves to work it out together. Thank you, Thomas. I, I think you highlighted two things in your statement uh, that I would like to invite also uh, David Miles uh, from Meta to answer to, and then also Agne. And that is uh, on the one hand, uh, the obligation to com for companies to implement these precautionary measures, which is laid down in the law. And it's, it's in, in the English British law, it's called duty of care. And uh, so I, I would like to, to learn from, from David Miles, how you see from, a, from the industry, industry perspective, these, uh, this implementation of precautionary measures. And in the German law, it's an open-ended list. So we don't have a list that you exactly have to say, point one, point two, point three, it's up to 
to the companies to develop their own measures. How do you feel about that? And then uh, afterwards, I would like to ask Arthur, um how this, this approach of uh, dialogic regulation fits into the DSA strategy. Uh, so David, please first, and then we take Agna. Yeah, sure. So I, I think both the German law and the, the proposed uh, online safety bill have some really interesting aspects to them, as indeed the age appropriate design code is. And if I go back to that as an example, we were given a year to respond to that before it came into force in September. And we've since that time also had guidance from the ICO and things like age assurance and a lot of other things. And it's just no surprise, really, that a lot of platforms have responded to that in terms of default settings around privacy and starting to progress product development in line and, and complying with those things. And that's really important to give industry time to, to use what they're good at, which is technology, to implement these things, but to see that as a progressive ongoing process. So, you know, we're looking at parental controls now, we're looking at um, time well spent, lots and lots of other stuff to see that as an ongoing process. So I think that's really important. I think the other challenge within the duty of care is that until now, most harms in regulation have been around illegal co content, illegal harmful content. And that's been quite clearly defined in law. Take CSUN, for example. Um, which we scan for and, and provide to NICMEC in the United States before it goes through to law enforcement. A lot of the laws within duty of care are, are legal but harmful, and so therefore we need much clearer definitions around some of those things, suicide and self-harm, bullying, different kinds of aspects. And there's also not just a rights element to that in terms of children and parental controls, but also in terms of children's health and well-being and to start to look at these things in more of a public health sort of way and to go back to the origins of some of these things. What, what brings about these harms? What's the offline manifestation of those things? And I was really encouraged by the European, European Commission's proposed plans around CSAM where there's a significant offline preventative element as well as an online one. And we've been pushing very heavily to to make sure really that detection is all very well and asking users to report, but what about prevention? What are we doing to prevent that in the first place? And in addition to that, proportionally, to make sure that the rest of the industry is doing it. It's no good large players displacing harm elsewhere um, um, without trying to make sure that we, for example, open source technologies so smaller companies with less capability can respond quickly, can use those technologies. So I think there's some exciting opportunities for smaller players that can have a disproportionate impact and often are, um, are just not as well resourced to respond. So I think these are really interesting times. Um, I think taking a systemic approach, in my world, the volumes of what we de deal with are huge. So dealing with individual pieces of content is challenging. So we welcome this concept of a proportional and systemic approach. We think that's definitely the way forward. I would make one other final point. What I find exciting when I go to Germany or I'm working with our public policy teams in Spain or France is the degree to which regulators are being beefed up. In other words, lots of expertise being brought in. They're well-funded, lots of expertise. It isn't just enough to have a piece of regulation because it has to evolve, but it actually have strong regulators that are well-resourced to be able to partner with as a major player on our side. So I think that, that collaborative pro approach, I think is gonna be really important. And my prediction is we'll see a shift in the balance of power from historically, you know, really uh, well-meaning, brilliant safety NGOs being the sole voice to um, new regulators who are also able to draw in the expertise from the NG those NGOs, which do a brilliant job to have a much more rounded platform on which to collaborate going forward. Thank you so much, David. And thank you also for the kind of compliments for beefing up the regulators, which is quite astonishing coming from a, a company. But I, I think you've well understood the, the approach of dialogic regulation uh, on your side uh, at Meta. Um, this is the thing that I wanted Agner to talk to. Uh, and also maybe you can reflect on this uh, term that David phrased, uh, a new type of regulators, would that also play a role on a European level? And I, I need to remind you to be brief because we also have uh, 
a question from the floor in Katowice that I would like to take then after your intervention, Agne. Sure, sure. It's uh, quick and easy questions as well, so it's uh, it's easy to be brief. No, um, I just want to actually highlight perhaps two points on this um, approach of sort of uh, a broad duty of care, uh, which has a lot of uh, different, um, so an open-ended list of measures that can be taken. Um, so there's a trade-off between a broad duty of care versus a specific obligation. And the trade-off is that um, companies, in terms of to be compliant, there's a lot more uncertainty if there is a broad duty of care. So I think this is just something that I wanted to highlight because this ties in also with the proportionality element. So in the DSA, we have different rules on different sort of sizes of services, depending on different sort of the, the impact they also have from a societal perspective uh, measured um, in reach. And of course, we know this is not a, um, a perfect system, but this is a system of proportionality that we found is, is currently the best that, that we could come up with. Um, and this is also because there are certain obligations that will be also for micro platforms for whom a broad duty of care would be un, uh, unmanageable um, because they require uh, specific uh, rules that they would then know how to really implement. Um, and also why this risk assessment and mitigation obligations are really for very large online platforms where we see these very systemic risks emerging. Um, and who actually also have, you know, the, the capacity to then deal um, with, with a relatively uh, burdensome obligation between, between one, and, uh, uh, one approach and the other. And, and hopefully they can be mixed, but in a proportionate manner. And then just a, a second point on sort of the, what I think David also touched upon, um, we need a lot more building up of knowledge base in this in this space. So I think uh, when we look at the social science uh, around the issues of online harms, we are still um, we are developing very fast, but we are still in you know we're still there's a lot more to to research and there is a lot more to understand between the dynamics. And so I think the purpose. Um, what we've tried to do in the DSA and what regulations should ideally do is to create the systems and the boundaries and the borders of how this um, knowledge can be developed. And, um, and this is why we have um, that platforms need to be transparent and create and, and sort of assess their own risks. But auditors need to come, up, come in independently and allow this to be also made, be made public in terms of what is being done. We also need independent research. Researchers need to be able to actually look into the data and see what is happening. And this will help everyone. Um, and of course, with these types of obligations, as David was saying, regulators really need to beef up uh, because these are complex issues. Um, and I think this will certainly create um, a new um, type of regulators at, at both member states and also um, at an EU level to sort of oversee these complex uh, systems because we're definitely seeing um, more sort of interdisciplinary issues crop up rather than less, and especially this in the online space. Thank you, Agne. A very helpful clarification from your side and also reminding us that there might be a trade-off between the different approaches. And we are very much looking forward to, to see how a mixed solution could be developed. We are now going to take uh, the question from Katowice. Uh, the person there, are you able to speak directly or do we need mm -hmm. a translation? Yes, I can speak directly. Uh, so, hi, my name is Arkadius, I'm from Poland, and I am a, an active internet user. And I would like to ask a question about a very specific problem, uh, advertisement. Uh, now, today, advertisement, there is an abundance of ads in social apps, in games apps, like, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Google. Uh, and very often these ads are well blended in into the UI of the app, so 
it, it's hard to tell the difference between what what is an ad and what is the content of the app. And uh, most importantly, very often these ads include um, inappropriate content like sexual character characters or uh, mis uh, missing uh, false advertising, which in fact woo children into clicking these ads and playing these mobile games or watching some kind of content. Uh, and of course, it is coherently bad to to um, to prey on on the uh, curiosity of uh, young children. Uh, but at the same time, uh, ads are main income for the companies. So I would like to ask how uh, in UK, in Germany, in Egypt, uh, the legislature tackled this problem and uh, how set companies, like from example Meta, see this problem. Thank you. Thank you for, for this very interesting question. I do think we don't have the time to make it through the table and get answers from all the panelists, but we have at the end, we have reserved uh, one minute for each of the speakers and maybe you can also address the, this question in case you have an answer. Uh, uh, to the question in regard of advertisement, I, I do think that uh, it is part of the age appropriate design code, which Bieben could probably refer to. And also, uh, I, I'm really interested in uh, in the answer from David Myers. So with having said that, I would like to open the final round for the panelists. Um, and we wanted to conclude on, uh, we've heard um, a lot of different regulatory approaches, but as uh, Bieben has put it before, also we have different arrangements and different approaches. We are trying to address similar problems and issues. Um, we have heard about the concept of dialogic regulation. I would be very much interested in hearing from those countries who haven't yet tried that approach, whether they, they see an opportunity for doing so. And uh, one final sentence, what would be your recommendations for policymakers in regard of uh, legislation, taking in consideration the rights of the child as laid down in the UNCRC and in the newly adopted general comment number 25. So who would like to start? Just go ahead to save us time. Thomas, I see you're looking to your colleague, Michael. Would you like to start? Uh, we, we can say something to your last uh, questions to the conclusions. Yes. Um, most importantly, um, we have to change our perspective on regulation, we guess. And traditionally, legislation was orientated on the technical features of different media. But we have to think from the children's point of view. That means fulfilling the triad of protection, empowerment, and participation has to be the main motivation for regulators. This understanding of child and youth protection leads to high standards and a holistic concept of child and youth protection. What is more, Article 12 of the United Nations Conventions, a Convention on the Rights of the Child demands us to let children participate in our processes. The concept of dialogic regulation to implement precautionary measures comes with two main advantages. On the one hand, to identify best practices for an approach with a high level of flexibility to face risks and make chances possible. And on the other hand, to reach a high level of obligation in relation to providers. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, who would like to take the floor next? Is it David, who's the next in my windows? Yeah, okay. Um, yes, I, th I think the thing I would say, I just wanted to come back to the advertising point. I mean, with Instagram and Facebook, we've already removed, um, uh, moved to a situation where advertisers are only able to target on the basis of age, gender, and location. What is really interesting is we have a, a division called TTC Labs, which does co-design with young people. And it was very much informed by that in, in the sense that 
it's what young people expect in those kind of environments. So I think that shift that is shifting already in terms of advertising of the mix of activities. So I just wanted to refer to that because that was the question that came from earlier on. And I think we outside of Europe have messenger kids with uh, millions of households using that technology. And again, it's the same process in terms of um, the, uh, the nature of advertising. So I think that's changing considerably. Um, and I think when you look across other platforms like gaming and other things as well, I would hope that we would see the same in those kind of environments over time. Thank you, David. Then I would like to turn to Kenneth once again. Kenneth, what is your approach in this regard and what recommendations do you have for policymakers in regard of legislation? Thank you. Uh, I think legislations or policymakers um, has to pass legislations in regard to a child online um, protection. This legislation should be inclusive, multifaceted, and um, using a multi-stakeholder approach and, and not even just a multi-stakeholder approach, but a multidisciplinary approach. In other words, it's not just about bringing different stakeholders to, 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 to as part of the team in developing the strategies and legal legislation framework, but also bringing the experts. Let's get the lawyers in there. Let's get the academias. Let's get the human, I mean, experts who know, who can, you know, be more informed into it. Also, this legislation has to be passed down. Usually we have the strategy at a higher level, policy level, government level, and it doesn't really go down to the technical community, to the academia, to the, and in Ghana, for instance, a good example is the national security, apart from the national cyber security strategy, which has a strong pillar on, on, on the protection of child online um, activity. Uh, uh, it hosts the national security has developed its national uh, security strategy. And this strategy is informed by the human rights you know, convention on child mm -hmm. online protection. And there's a pillar in there. Apart from that, we've seen the national security go ahead to create awareness for all the security agencies under their, their remit, educating them, you know, ensuring, and you see the minister coming out to speak on human rights, you know, respecting human rights, respecting all this child. So I think it is very key. I also think that the technical community who are the custodians of this digital infrastructure in implementing controls or protecting systems to protect their infrastructure should always aim at enabling children to be um, active in safe in, in, and secured in this digital infrastructure. Usually the focus is not there, but the focus should, should be more in there. Um, the national uh, telecom regulators and the ICT regulators, I believe has to um, begin to come out with their legislations or, or regulations to enforce acceptable standards in all the industry places in this technical communi communication um, infrastructures. I have seen that being done in Ghana. Ghana has the, we have the national set, we have the sectorial sets, and we have a sectorial set that is controlled by the telecom regulator. This sectorial set has oversight on on all the telecom and ICT in, in industries that they ensure that, you know, the provisions are in, Kenneth, the, those are in the, I, yeah. I need I need to stop you. We've only left three minutes and we have three speakers who, who sure. have to sum up. So sure. thank, thank you, you so, so much, much to welcome. remind us for uh, on the acceptable standards, which is very important and we'll go into the report. Um, now I would like to go to Hoda with only one sentence. We have only left three minutes. Okay, so my recommendation is as a technology is the, is the, is the main enabler and the main risk. So it's hold the solution as well by using the disruptive technology now. And then, so I recommend issuing policies and regulation that support the private sector positive content and by promoting the development of further application and using the AI and machine learning to, uh, to, to see the indicators and figures that help the government to monitor uh, the, the user behaviors. And so it um, uh, can predict what will happen in the future and the threats of the future. And uh, I, I have to say that the, the, the community now have the authorities uh, to, to give the feedback. So it has the authorities to, to, to be the, the, yeah, the main impact to the growth and loss of any uh, social media uh, platform and application. 
So it's very, very important to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to aware and make uh, awareness for uh, the community to, 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 to use this authority. And at the end, no laws will guarantee full child online protection. But fortunately, policies and best practices will lead to bridge those gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hoda. That was very helpful indeed. Um, uh, Agna, I, I think it wouldn't make sense to ask you for recommendations for policymakers in regard of legislation towards uh, child online safety. But uh, my question to you would be, if you sum up the, the session and what you've heard, how could we ensure that uh, the best interest of the child is given highest priority when legislation is made? Your short sentence to that question please i think from the from at least the eu perspective but i think this is also highlighted in in globally um the rights of the child are are very specific so in the eu charter of fundamental rights they are the only rights that apply to all parties including private sector so otherwise most of the other rights are directed towards government um, and for the government for safe safe keeping these rights, but these are really also um, also for the private sector. So I think just taking that into account whenever planning for any type of legislation um, is crucial. Thank you so much. Very quick and very precise. Bieben, I think you have the last word of this session. <laughs> I love having the last word. Um, I know thank that. You. Um, uh, so I just really want to say there is no silver bullet. And if you think about, you know, I often think about the Industrial Revolution here, you know, and we had 14 factory acts just on workers' rights inside, including child labor. But we also at that time invented the weekend and we put street lighting in and we put regulation around sewers because people came to the city. So I think we must see this as as a journey and what we have to do is get each piece right instead of making each piece a Christmas tree that's that's my big recommendation to everyone I do want to honor the person who asked a question and just say you know you're absolutely right to be concerned about advertising but don't concentrate just on the adverts and the content of the adverts although I think scam adverts are scams and fraudulent uh, you have to look at the whole um infrastructure around data and targeting and personalization that is the infrastructure underneath the advertising model so i think you're right to concentrate on it and normally uh, if you want to get something right in regulation it is worth following the money and that is where the money is thank you very much thank you for this final word even i think uh, this was a good conclusion and also an answer to the question we got from the floor i would like to take the opportunity to say a big big thank you to all of you for joining this session and making it a very fruitful debate we are uh, obliged to deliver a report in two hours time so i will be a little bit busy after this session because i have taken so much notes i would like to thank my colleague torsten krauser who helped to organize the session to set the agenda and who was also helping to moderate in the chat i also would like to thank my colleague clemens gruber from the digital opportunities foundation who will help with the minutes and a big big thank you to all our speakers and to all the participants in the session I'm pretty sure we will continue with that debate. I would like to refer you to the main session that will take place on Thursday, 11.15 Central European time, uh, which deals with regulation. And we'll, it will have a look backwards, how we came to the situation we have now and how, what will come in the future. So you're all invited to take part in that main session. Thank you so much for being here and have a nice evening morning, afternoon, whatsoever, and pretty much looking forward to a festive holiday in two weeks' time. Thank you, and bye-bye. And the biggest thank to you, Jutta, for inviting, organizing, and moderating this workshop and session. Um, great job. Well done. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Well done.